Right now? We are, so they can hear our behind the scenes. Oh, right okay, now. great. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fine. They just know I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and wise. <laughs> yeah, somehow I missed that whole thing, Jay. <laughs> the whole wise thing. So I just got old. What? I don't know. It's weird. Well, I've got one o'clock. You gents want to get started? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right, great. I'll kick things off here. So good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joining us there on the East Coast, and good morning if you're on the West Coast. Thanks for being here for today's webinar, The Essence of the Four Impact Strategy on Major Gift Success. My name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And today I'm by two leaders in the nonprofit sector. The first is Tom Suttas. Good morning, Tom. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for being here. For those of you don't, who don't know Tom, uh, Tom founded the Suttas Group in 1983 after serving as Director of Development for the University of Notre Dame and after founding 11 companies in various sectors. In 25 years, his group has raised actually over $1 billion for organizations around the world, and they've run more than 400 successful fundraising campaigns and transformed more than 5,000 organizations through training, coaching, and their consulting services. So it's, it's quite an honor to have Tom join us today after uh, reading that resume. So thanks again for being here. Oh, you're welcome, Steve. I love you. <laughs> and also joining us is my colleague here at Bloomerang, Jay Love. He's the founder and CEO here at Bloomerang. Hey there, Jay. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Some of you may recognize Jay as the original co-founder of eTapestry. He's currently a senior vice president at Avectra in addition to his duties over here at Bloomerang, which of course keep him very busy. So thanks for taking the time to join us, Jay. Anxious to do this. Uh, Tom and I have not done a joint session for almost five years, so this is going to be <laughs> wonderful to reenact again. Yeah, this is a good one just from looking through the slides from what I've seen. So what we're going to do today is Tom's going to get the conversation started. He's going to outline his four impact strategy. And then, Jay's, and then he's going to hand it off to Jay, who's going to talk about how to keep those donors uh, donating to your organization after they've made that major gift. And as always, what we do on our Bloomerang webinars is we leave some time at the end for a Q&A session. So if you hear anything during either Tom or Jay's presentation that maybe you wanted clarified or repeated, uh, feel free to type in any questions. Uh, on the chat function, and I'll see those, and I'll field those questions uh, towards the end of the session, and we'll try to answer as many as, as we can. And we will be sending out the slides of the presentation and a video recording. Um, so we'll be sending that out this afternoon for anyone who wants to uh, view it again or maybe refresh uh, some of the content. So don't be afraid to ask questions during the presentation. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Tom. So go for it. Oh, great. Thanks, great, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Well, it's a pleasure to actually be on this with you and, and with Jay. I've, Jay and I have been friends for a long time. I admired what he did at eTapestry, and he was just one of the leaders in the field there. So it's great to be on your uh, on this Bloomerang uh, opportunity here for me to share a little bit about our four impact. And then uh, I'm kind of interested to hear what you guys have got going as well. So this will be great. So listen, that first slide up there for me is a is a pretty big deal. It's at maybe 50,000 feet, not 30,000 feet. It's just B4 impact. And what what we used to use that as a term to B4 impact as your organization, but actually it it, it also means to B4 impact as a person. You know, uh, my partner Nick Fellers always says, you know, people are always striving for purpose and looking for purpose and meaning and all that. And that's kind of a journey, a lifetime journey. Being for impact is a decision. You can actually just make a decision right now that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an impact. I'm going to have an impact today, whether that be through your uh, organization, through your company, or in your personal life to just have an impact. That next slide, Steve, if you don't mind for me, is my St. Paul knocked off the horse epiphany. Um, it's been a driver for us for the last 10 or 15 years, and it's, it's a very simple statement. It says that your impact drives your income, not the other way around. 
anybody who's on this listening to this, um, hey, Steve, actually, why don't you jump to the next one? It has a little bit more on that, and people can look at that. We're there, we're there Tom. Yeah, we've Great. got that. So impact odds didn't come not the other way around. You know, uh, Stephen Covey, uh, rest in peace, was no money, no mission, which we all loved in this industry. We loved it that a Stephen Covey could come out and say, fundraising was okay, and you needed money to drive your mission. But actually, um, I think the corollary is, is cause of at least equal value in that no mission, no money. So the idea that your impact drives your income has huge implications and applications. I know that a lot of people on this call right now and viewing this webinar are, are in the development field and in the fundraising field, and I don't want you all to hang up on us, but the idea here is that one implication is this really isn't about fundraising. It's not about development. It's not even about money. Money is just worthless wampum. When you really think about what we do, the blue, and these are color-coded for you, the idea of the blue, the impact driving income, not the other way around. But what's really cool about that is and the other big implication is that we better be able to talk clearly, concisely, compellingly, convincingly, any other C word you want about our impact. Because if we can't do that, we can't go out and raise the kind of money, the kind of income, the kind of revenue through philanthropy or any other words you want to use to have a greater impact. So if we want to scale and grow our impact, if you, slide, if you go to that next slide about size and scope of impact, right. um, determine size and scope of income. Everybody on this phone, I, I've got a, a list here and I see the names of some are familiar words and some are new to this. But just a reminder to everybody, and I say this with a lot of admiration and respect for, for all that you do, there's nobody on this call right now whose income actually matches the size and scope of your impact. I'll let that sink in just for a second, okay? There's, there's really nobody who, who's generating the kind of income that matches the size and scope of your impact. So as you look at the next thing, we're saying this really isn't about being a not-for-profit. It's not about being a charity. It's not about tax-exempt and 501c3s and all that stuff. It's, it's truly about your impact. And clearly, the better you could articulate your impact, the more money you can get. The more money you can get, if you were to draw a red dotted line back underneath from income to uh, impact, you could easily do the old Lion King circle of life kind of thing because, hey, we out, we present our impact. People love it. They give us income, which allows us to have a greater impact. Not meant to be overly simplistic, but it is meant to be a simple, high-level driver for everybody on this call. So uh, what I'd love to do right now, if, it was, if it's okay, um, we, we do... We do quite a bit around this idea of vocabulary and the way you talk. Um, even if you're on this call from the four impact world or in the boomerang world and you've heard a little bit about uh, what we do or maybe you've even had us do this vocabulary change live with you. I just did it yesterday with a large group of hospital uh, of healthcare development people from around the country. And half of them had already heard this, but you get something from it every time. I want to do a little vocab change with you. You see the, the words there, not for profit. I'm hoping everybody on the phone, even though it's on your computer, if you're taking any notes, you would know right away what I'm looking for there. And it's really not about that. It's about being for impact. So we have a lot of orgs in the, in the world right now who call themselves a for impact organization instead of a not-for-profit. So that's the first one. Charity, um, I'm fine with the word charity. If you want to go in a biblical sense, love, uh, all those kinds of words, but I'm not real comfortable with that word when, when we're in this four-impact world if we're tied to development. We don't need charity. 
we don't need people stuffing $5 bills in that big red kettle. You know, now, this is the only place on here. You put whatever word you want next to charity. It could be cause. We use that a lot. It could just be a simple word like philanthropy, which is Greek for friend of mankind. Um, it's not charity. It's philanthropy. It's, it's, it's the ability to actually make a, a gift that's going to change the world or change your community or change the hospital. The on the board, this one's so simple, gang. You just put a big line through the. Just get rid of P-H-E, and what do you have? You have on board. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for people and leaders and philanthropists to be on board, not on the board. Um, there's so many implications of that. Um, I'm going to throw in a little quick sidebar here right now, Jay and Steve, if I could, because all of our listeners and viewers right now have challenges with their board. I mean, we just all do. Everybody does. But right now, many, many cases, we're actually saying to our boards, you're responsible for fundraising. And I would come back, and it's going to be a, a, a little bit of heresy for some people and very challenging, but your board's not responsible for fundraising. How's that working for you? Saying to your board, give us names. Saying to your board, go out and raise money. Saying to your volunteers, go ask your friends for money. It just doesn't work. So here are three, it's a sidebar nugget, but here are three great ways to set up the role for your board. Your board should, number one, be champions for your organization. Champions. So they should, uh, I'll do a, the verb, they should champion your organization. Number two uh, on their role is they should invite other people to get engaged and involved with what you do. If you're a board member and you're not willing to invite others to get engaged, you should get off the board. And obviously, if they're not willing to be a champion, they should get off the board as well. And third, they should invest, but they should invest with a commensurate commitment. This whole idea of give or get $10,000 and wealth, wisdom, all that other stuff, I mean, that's like 1950s, 1970s, um, She's Jay and I were the only ones on this call who were actually born that long ago. <laughs> so the idea, uh, you know, we're the only ones who remember those days. But the idea here is that uh, champion, invite, and invest. Don't ask your board to go out and raise money for you. That'd be like uh, Boeing uh, asking volunteers to go sell 747s for them. So champion, invite, and invest. So here's the big one, though. So the idea of donors and donation. And Steve? I'm going to encourage you on this one there, partner. Um, okay. Really, when you, if, I, if I had everybody on audio and I did a word association and I said, donor, so many times in an audience, whether it's 1,000 people or 10 people, if you, once you get past money, it's like blood or mm -hmm. organs. Okay? <laughs> so really, this whole idea of donor and donation in my world only works for the American Red Cross or the kidney people. The words that we love to use are, and I, I won't go deep here, but are investor and investment. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's a different conversation when you're talking to somebody about making an investment, whether it's in a college they went to, whether it's in the hospital that saved their child's life, whether it's an investment in a community priority uh, in the arts, uh, whatever it is, it's an investment Okay, an investor and an investment. And of course, what does everybody want from an investment? Steve, will you answer for the whole audience? What does everybody want from their investment? I guess to feel good about it. To feel good, but what's the big word that you would put if you said if you said an investment? What are you looking for if you were making a cash investment? Like oh, a, a return. return. A return, a return. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Because everybody wants a return. But for some reason in our industry, in our world, for so long, it was more about a warm, fuzzy feeling, okay? And that's the part about feeling good. It's there. But there's a legitimate return on investment. When I invest in one of these hospitals we were working with yesterday, that has an impact on my employees, my family, 
the quality of life in the community, the quality of my care. So it's an investment with a return. Now, I would challenge everybody on this call, Jay and Steve, to be able to talk about really what is that return. It's kind of a logic magic piece, left, right brain, if you will. Here's the, here's the return tangibly, and here's the intangible return. So cultivation is just, I'll grab a few words. We have a long list of words that we try and help people change the way they think and talk. But cultivation, I have a small farm, as Jane knows. In fact, Jane and Steve were just there a couple weeks ago. I got some animals running around and uh, a bunch of grandkids. I'm not sure which is the greater number, but <laughs> I got a farm. So in the farmer's world, cultivation is when you spread manure on your plant. Okay, it's like a fertilizer thing. And yet in our world, that cultivation world word, I think, has screwed up more potential relationships than just about any other. I'm a little bit on my soapbox right now, but I don't think this is about moose management. I don't think we can sit down with people three, four, five times before we finally say to them, this is where we need your help. It's a different world. It's 2013 right now. People don't want to meet with you three times because you're worried there isn't a relationship before you finally say to them, this is where we need your help. So that cultivation word, the, the opposite of that for us is maximize relationships. So it's not cultivation. It's actually maximizing the relationship. And I'm going to add four words, A-T-G-M to that, at this given moment. Now, I know, Jay, uh, I know Jay well enough to know what he's done in the past and what I think he's trying to do with Bloomerang. Part of what, we're, what I'm saying to you right now is you've got to maximize the relationships at this given moment. If that's walking out of a visit with $1,000, if that's taking a major gift prospect and instead of talking to them four different times, on the very first time you ask them to join the president's circle. What is that? It's a great thing. Here are all the benefits. Well, how much does it cost? It doesn't cost anything. It does require a $10,000 annual investment, and there's your return. So that's maximizing the relationship. could be a million dollars. The number is not the relevant point here. Stop cultivating. Start maximizing relationships. And again, uh, I won't put Jay and Steve on the spot, but uh, if you were all on live on audio right now and I said, Word Association and yelled into this phone or on the webinar, appointment, what would be the first thing that would come to mind? It's almost always doctor. And then right. worse than a doctor is dentist. So this idea of going out and getting appointments just doesn't make any sense. And I'm not trying to play semantic gymnastics, Jay and Steve, with, with our audience here. This is not just word changes to play games. This is actually trying to help people change the way they think about this business in this area. So instead of appointments, what if we were on a visit? Again, not trying to get cute, but what does a visit imply to our audience right now? I mean, think about that. The idea of a visit implies friendship. You both want to be there. An appointment, no friendship, and one of the two parties does not want to be there on an appointment. Okay? And it, it's just a different way of looking at things. If it's a visit, it allows for shoulder to shoulder conversation. Uh, we have a great chance to be able to talk about our impact, and we're with somebody that wants to be there with us. And finally, I've got the change vocab is about the idea of ask for money. Um, we're really big about just to ask, but we're not real big about asking for money. Uh, Jay and Steve, I've, I've done this, as you guys know, over 6,000 times. Um, I, I, I hate asking people for money. I, I've also screwed up 5,812 times of the 6,000, so I've kept count. But we still <laughs> managed to raise a lot of money. Um, I want to... Uh, I want you to think about not asking for money. The idea is to present the opportunity. And again, not trying to get into the semantics, but presenting people an opportunity is way different than going out with an attitude, I have to ask somebody for money. 
We're giving people, as Drucker would say, a chance to move from success to significance, which is a pretty phenomenal thing. Hey, Steve, I'm going to go a little faster on the next one. It's, it's, it's a, uh, oh, we're jumping to Just Ask. Thanks. Just Ask, just don't ask for money. Uh, this is a pretty big guiding principle for us. It means you should be talking about your impact, not about the dollars. Okay? Uh, our average scholarship, our grant to our students is $5,000. Jay, would you and Steve and Bloomerang be able to help us by supporting five students a year? So we don't ask for $25,000. We ask Jay and Steve to help us support 25,000 students. If uh, hey Jay and Steve, if you go from just ask to that next one, it's like you're in sales. Get over it. So we have a lot of fun with this one. But the fact that if you're in development, and if you're a CEO on this call and an executive director, your green team, your your development team, better acknowledge they're in sales. Sales team, sales process, sales system. We're selling. Dan Pink, great book, just out. To sell is human. Everybody sells, okay? We have to acknowledge that. And then finally, some really good quotes, and we'll finish out this piece on just ask. Even Gandhi, even Gandhi says, if you don't ask, you don't get. And in the Bible, it's ask, and you shall be given, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened. But I want you to look at the first three letters, A, S, and, a, S, and K. It spells ask. <laughs> it's kind of like Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. I mean, somebody 2,000 years ago was thinking about the word ask. There you have it in Hebrew, Hebrew, Rakhbap, Makash. The Irish, we do a lot of work in Ireland, Jay and Steve. And the Ireland, Irish people can't say it in few words at all. So it's like, but only put the question. So, hey, I want to, I got a couple other nuggets here, Jay, and then maybe we can flip it to you and we can open it up. But, the next nugget is a big deal for us. Spend more time with better prospects. Boy, if you took anything away from this webinar right now from us is Brian Tracy is one of the best sales trainers in the world. Spend more time with better prospects. And the next one has had huge play with us. We do trains all around. Uh, we just did it again yesterday, and I, I'm not kidding. These are prof these were long-term professional development people. And everybody in the room yesterday, 60 people acknowledged that they make decisions for their prospects. And Jay and Steve, we've got to stop doing that. We have to stop making decisions for our people. Well, this isn't the right time. They can't give this amount, something like that. And the next slide I've already covered a little bit around maximized relationships, but they're up there for you at this given moment. Make it happen now. That's a respect of the people you're with in terms of their time and energy. They agreed to see you, or they agreed to take your call, or however you're asking them, however you're presenting the opportunity. Let's max that relationship right now. The next box is just a simple way to put all this together for you. If the goal is to get a visit, not an appointment, qualified prospect, potential investor, not a donor, Share the story, not spew more information. Present opportunities, not ask for money. Great uh, metaphorical and physical thing here, shoulder to shoulder, not face to face, eyeball to eyeball confrontation. And to fund the vision, not talk about survival. Um, I think all of those, uh, all of those provide at least, Jay, a good framework for all of us to do it. There's, there's more information on here about um, uh, some engagement tools and stuff like that, but I have to tell you, I think the thing that we should focus right now, let me ask about call reluctance. It's up on your screen right now. Um, why aren't we actually out making more visits? Why don't we have stronger relationships? And for us, it's three things. The fear is not it. Uh, it's just obviously... I've made 6,000 visits. I, I've never been shot, and I've only been swung at twice. So <laughs> the idea of just let's just set that aside for a moment. So one, you don't believe in your cause or case. Clearly, that's not true with people on the phone. If that were true, you should leave your job. But number two is a lot of times we can't articulate our message. Well, whose responsibility is that, the prospect or yours? And finally, number three, 
we're not sure with good prospects or we have relationships. And Jay and Steve, I think that's a great tee up for you guys because what I think you've built now is a way to better measure those relationships and better measure number of contacts. And I know you're gonna, I know you're gonna get there uh, at some point. Um, what I, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just leave that there. Jay has a chance now to talk a little bit about. So I love this heading: is the lifetime value of your database, and the idea of lifetime relationships. Uh, and again, Jay, I, I admire Jay a lot. He's a ridiculously smart guy. Uh, I actually don't understand most of what he says to me, but I really, really like him. And well, um, thank you, Tom. I'm up right now to share a little bit about Boomerang. And uh, I guess, Steve, I'll just stay on, obviously. And if yes, please do, Tom. We will, uh, we will want you to be for around it. for the questions. Yeah, please do, Tom. In fact, those of you that are out uh, listening there and watching, uh, when we get to the question answer period, ask Tom about a couple of his stories from his time uh, doing major gifts at Notre Dame University. I think you'll get a kick out of a story or two there, so we'll keep that. What Tom is saying is, is very true about the, the you've, you've got people that are funding your vision, and you know the nice thing about it, if you follow Tom's philosophy, what we're talking about is a very natural follow along. It's much different than somebody that has just been brought along to sit at a table at a gala or sponsored somebody that's running in a 10K race or a marathon. Those people haven't really thought much about your vision. They're there for the event category or something of that nature, and it's much, much harder to bring them in. But what we're going to talk about is if you have people that are donors and you take all of your donors for the previous year, if we can keep those in the fold, how we can double the lifetime value of your database. And when we talk about doubling the lifetime value and doing what Tom's saying there, the final piece of the puzzle is an effective use of the donor database. You know, we've got to make sure that making the ask is a very natural progression of the relationship. It can be right up front, as Tom says, or it can be somebody that's been involved with your organization. Now you're going back and you're saying you're really going to help us fund our vision in a major way uh, to do that. And having the information at your fingertips of how long this person's been involved with your organization, how they, uh, how to what in degree they've been involved, uh, et cetera, is very, very important to help you with that process. So lifetime value, to define it very simply, it's the total net contribution that a donor generates during his or her lifetime in your database. And this is a very good discussion point for any board meeting. I remember uh, at a, on a, one of the boards I'm on is a um, food bank, and we brought this conversation up, and the average board member had no idea how many years a donor stayed in their database and what the average gift was. And we, when we told them that the average gift, because it, there was a lot of direct mail involved in the food bank world, that the average gift was below $175, I think that sort of floored a lot of the people there uh, as they did that. And so knowing what this is can make a huge difference on how you're driving things going forward. So let me talk a little bit about the retention. Uh, and hopefully many of you out there uh, know exactly what your retention levels are. And if not, I'll share with you the formula for figuring the retention in just a second. But if you would venture a guess here, and I'll just ask this rhetorically, what does a 10% increase in donor retention rate mean in terms of lifetimes dollars raised? If you can just move whatever your retention rate is up 10%, does it make a 50% difference, a 100% difference, or a 150 to 200% difference? And so many of you out there may be familiar with some of the math that's involved with donor retention, but it's actually the latter one there. It can make up to a doubling occur by just moving that needle 10%. And I'm hoping that that value that we're talking about there and what that impact can be to your mission really help us garner your attention. Because if you're not worrying about retention, this is what can happen. If your retention rate is 20% here, look what happens. If 20% of your database drops off, you've got 1,000 donors. At the end of year one, you've got 800. At the end of year five, you've got 328 donors. 
But let's talk more about what the national average is. The national average for attrition for nonprofits in this country is 59%, 1% away from this bottom line. That means if you're losing 60% a year, you go from 1,000 to 400. But look where you are at the end of five years. That 1,000 has dwindled down to just 10 donors if we only have a 40% retention, thereby equaling a 60% attrition rate for that. Now, we pulled some of that data together. This was pulled from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. And what's really sort of scary, when you look at the retention here in the nonprofit world of 41%, compare that to what you're seeing here in the commercial world and think in terms of businesses where they have a retention rate of 94%. And that 94% retention rate is taken from publicly held technology companies. That was the average rate of retention of their customers. And this is what's happened to the retention over the last five years. You can see it's moved from 50% down to the 41%. And what's really scary, for first-year donors, it's 27%. And notice the vast difference here if you get someone to their second or third year. The ret overall average for those individuals is 70%. So I love what a good, another good friend of mine in the industry says, uh, Dr. Adrian Sargent, that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. If someone hasn't become a second time or a second year donor, then what is the, you know, what is that definition? So if you can change your mindset that they become a donor to your organization at the time of the second gift or the second year and really work toward that, you make a vast difference because, as you can tell from this study population, there were about 70% of the organizations that had an overall retention rate, including first and multi-year donors, of 70% or higher. And that means that it can be done. Now, when we talk about addressing this retention problem and seeing what it can mean over the uh, ensuing years that someone's with your organization, I really got to ask this question. Is it a donor relationship problem? Have we failed in some way to connect so that person doesn't feel like they have a relationship with us? I'll put it in Tom's terms. Do they not realize what our mission is and what impact they're having on that mission? And so we'll explore that here in just a minute. But I'm going to bring in two additional experts. Haven't known either one of these folks quite as long as I've known Tom, but the sort of the father of all the research on donor retention and donor loyalty is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Adrian Sargent. And Dr. Sargent is the, uh, the endowed chair of that discipline at the Center of Philanthropy here at this IU school. And he's also involved with the university in the UK and in Australia. And he's done 22 years of research into donor retention, donor loyalty, donor engagement. And we have taken the work from Dr. Sargent and embedded his best practices into our application. On the other side there is Mr. Tom Ahern. And he's sort of known as the donor communication guru or the donor communication coach. And he works with everything from national nonprofits to medical institutions to schools to some of the very small local grassroots organizations and making a genuine impact to the type of communications that they're doing. And it was actually Dr. Sargent that coined this phrase here of a 10% improvement in retention can double the lifetime value of your donor database. And I actually had him prove that to me via a uh, spreadsheet. And it is the, the numbers do add up very, very quickly. So when we talk about what is your retention rate, it's very simply the formula that you see on the screen right now. It's the number of donors in the current 12 months that have, that have given in the current 12 months that were previously donors in the previous 12 months. So if you take all the people that gave to your organization in 2011 and figure out how many, if there were 1,000 of them, if 40, 450 of those gave in 2012, you would have a retention rate of 45%. You can also do that based upon the dollar impact. And that can be based upon how many the donors and how much they gave in the previous year based upon those same donors, what they gave in this year. And you usually find that that retention rate is a little bit higher because your larger donors do tend to stay with you, the people that do have a strong belief in your mission. And I'm just going to share a couple screenshots from uh, within the uh, Bloomerang database. But this is our 
dashboard and as you can see when you come in the first thing that you will notice is the actual retention rate for the current three year we go back exactly 365 days and see how many donors you've retained compared to the previous 365 so this wheel actually changes every single day and every single week so you can see how much your retention rate is moving up or down and what's exciting about that is and I, I love uh, we've got several customers that have been using the software for a few months and I I get emails every once in a while that we moved our retention rate above 50 percent or we moved our retention rate above 60 percent and I actually had one from the Washington DC area just about a month ago where it was somebody who had moved their retention rate up to 73 percent and Tom, as you know from working in this industry, if you can keep 73% of your donors from one year to the next, you are going to fund a whole lot of mission. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it's going to make a huge difference. So let's talk for a minute and compare. Let's compare the commercial sector. I want you to think about your local dry cleaner, your local drugstore, maybe a local restaurant. Why do customers leave? And this is from a study that was done by the Forrester Group here. And you can see the percentages. 1% left because of death. There's not much we can do about that. 3% moved away. Only 5% were won over by a competitor. 14% left because of bad complaint handling. But 77% left because of lack of interest from them. And for those of you that have heard me talk before, I've got to share the story of my local dry cleaners. I have a local dry cleaner that I've been going to now for an excess of 10 years. And in that entire 10-year period, and I'm in there almost every single week, at the very least once every two weeks to pick up my dry clean shirts and stuff, the owner or none of the employees there have ever called me by my first name. So I started an experiment a couple years ago. Anytime I go in there, whoever's working, I call them by first name. Now, bear in mind, for over 10 years, I have been handing whoever's working my debit card. And what is written on the very front of my debit card? It says JB Love right there. And they have never remembered my, my being by name to do that. And so I'm going to keep experimenting with this because it's such beautiful fodder for my presentations to, to see here. But all, you know, it would not take much for me to move to someplace else there. So it's, it just tells you how that can happen. Now let's talk about the key reasons for donors leaving. And this is taken directly from Dr. Sargent's research. And this has been tested year after year after year. These are some of the key reasons. And I, as I go through those, think about how many of these are tied directly to communication and relationship. No longer able to support support. Not much we can do there. Next one, no memory of ever supporting. Obviously, that was probably not a face-to-face -face ask like Tom was referring to, someone that has no memory of ever supporting your organization uh, that's coming into place. The organization asked for inappropriate sums, feeling that other causes are more deserving. Next one, they were never reminded to give again. One of the very important ones, the organization did not inform us of how the funds or the monies were used. And tying it all together, the most prevalent one was that they just did not feel connected. And I want to share with you an experiment that all of you can do. And Tom's heard me mention this before because I did it for many years. For about a 10-year period at my previous company at eTapestry, for every new employee, I wanted them to really get to know a lot more about the nonprofit sector and just what it's about. I gave every employee $100. And I asked them to do one thing, and that was to make 10 $10 gifts with only two caveats. The two caveats were half of the donations had to go to local charities and half of them had to go to national. I also further asked them to split it up so that half of them were online donations and the other half were either given face-to-face -face or via the mail. And they were, their task was to make those donations and then to report back to me in 90 days of which ones of those 10 organizations built a relationship and which ones did not, and which ones that they felt like they would ever support again. By the way, for all of you listening out there, this is an easy experiment you can try because try making some small donations to some national charities and see how they treat you. Some of those employees are still supporting those charities to this day, and it was quite fascinating to see how that came about. 
And so much of this is based upon engagement. And this is one of the real differentiating factors with the Bloomerang software uh, is this engagement level. And what we're looking at here is that people can move from each one of these quadrants from cold to cool to warm to hot to on fire. And the software as part of your day-to-day -day usage keeps track of that. And how we keep track of that is in these factors right here. All of these engagement factors actually move the needle up or down. Uh, to do that. So we can take a look at whether or not what their pattern of giving is, whether they're an outright cash or check donor versus uh, a multi-year pledge or a recurring transaction. The number of years of giving. Each year that someone gives, we move their engagement level up. Whether or not they're giving from one year to the next is upgrading or downgrading. Obviously, lapsing moves it way down. The next area here on both of these for volunteering and event attendance we see those as little indicators of how engaged somebody is. If someone's been a volunteer for many, 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 many years, and I saw this happen at the food bank time and time again, during their lifetime, they were only able to give a small gift of a few hundred dollars a year, but they left their estate to that nonprofit that they volunteered at for all those years. And all of a sudden, somebody that made a $100 gift for 25 years in a row left a half a million dollar estate to the organization. And their engagement level was very high. And it's very easy to track these, especially if someone is, is registering or volunteering via your website. Communication plays a part here, too, these areas here. If someone, when you send an email to them, they actually open the email, they click on links, they forward it to other people, they subscribe or unsubscribe, they tell you their communication preferences, all of these move that. And then one that I know, Tom, you have to be a big believer in, if someone is reaching out to you, if they call you first, whether you're calling them, or they write you an email, or they just stop by to visit your facility, those inbound interactions are a keen indicator of their engagement with you. And then soft credits. What I'm basically talking about here is stewardship. This is key. Are they bringing other people to the table? Are they bringing in a matching gift employer? Do they perhaps have a family foundation to do that? So all of these areas move it either up or down. So for instance, unsubscribing from an email would move the engagement needle downward. So and social media is all new on the scene. And, and Tom and I kicked this around last time I was over at his place, you know, uh, whether someone liking you on Facebook or saying something about you on Twitter. But we all know those can be little indicators of interest and engagement that can move this up. And Tom, can you imagine having a tool when you were at Notre Dame that would let you know which people were in those top two categories before you go? Yeah, that would be great. That? And yep. it, it would totally be a game changer to do that. This can also be done in a reporting format so we can see a report of all the people that are at each of these levels and what amounts they've given in the past and et cetera. So it just becomes a tool that can guide you in each of these areas. So before I leave, I wanted to leave you with five key retention drivers uh, for that. Tom's talking about how you you bring people into the fold, but five key ways to keep them, and then we're going to open it up for questions with everybody. Number one, let people know how you are reaching your mission. Any type of mission performance data that you can share, whether it's in a newsletter, et cetera, is very important. Next, connect often. Uh, you know, People love to hear about what's going on, and they love for you to connect in multiple ways. It's not just an email. It's not just a phone call. But any other way that you can connect with them in multiple manners, maybe a text, maybe a face-to-face -face visit. Be personal and segment. Let people know exactly what their monies are doing. Uh, and, and each time you address them, try to be as personal in those salutations and, and any other way that you're reaching them as possible. Find and use the numerous human connectors. If someone has come to you, via a special event if they sit at the table, maybe the next communication you have with that individual should be from the person who invited them telling them what the mission of your organization means to them personally. And then last but not least, always communicate exactly what they did, what impact they had. Tom said it beautifully. If you make an investment, we want to know what the return is. So with that, Stephen, 
can we go ahead and throw it open for some questions and see what people would like to know from Tom or myself? Yeah, definitely. Let's do that. We've got a couple of questions that we're sending over the chat room. And uh, for those of you listening, if there's anything that you'd like to ask Tom or Jay or both of them, you know, feel free to send those in through the chat window there. Uh, I'll see them and I'll be uh, fielding those to uh, the two gentlemen here uh, for the remainder of our time. We will try to get done by the 2 o'clock hour. Um, so let's just jump right into it. I mean, Tom, that was a great conversation. I think it definitely got some people thinking about what they're doing. Okay. Uh, Thanks, there Steve. was a there are a couple of interesting questions. Um, Douglas was wondering uh, what what do you think the best approach is when maybe you're at an event uh, and how to introduce yourself to maybe a potential donor or someone that you've identified as someone that you'd like to 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 make that gift. How would you approach that situation? Well, I, uh, boy, that's interesting. So, I mean, ideally, uh, we use the term natural partner, Steve. So, Douglas, ideally. I would like to not have to do that. I would love to grab my natural partner, be that a volunteer, a board person, uh, maybe a friend of theirs, somebody else at the table, and I'd pull them aside and say, hey, uh, hey, Steve, I really want to meet with Jay Love. I heard all about him. Uh, boy, he's much older than I thought he was. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> uh, but anyway, you get my point. I'd, I'd rather have Steve introduce me to Jay than me just walking up. But hey, if I have to walk up, Douglas, our, uh, a big word in our world is authenticity. I would walk up to Jay and say, Jay, I'm Tom Suttis. I've always wanted to meet you. Um, I've heard a lot about you. Uh, here's what I do. Uh, you know, however you want to do it. But I think being authentic instead of trying to like fake something or come up with some artificial baloney. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a natural partner, Douglas, or I'd love to have, uh, I'd love to just be totally authentic with that. What do you think of that, Jay? You've, you've probably been solicited a few times. I got, I've got to harken back a few decades ago to the seventh grade dance. And there was a young lady that I wanted to have a dance with, Tom. And you're right. I used that natural partner. I knew somebody that knew that person that could make yep. that introduction. And by golly, it worked. I got that dance. First it does up work. Well, today we know it worked if you got the dance because she couldn't have wanted to dance with you, so she had to do it with somebody else. I went through yep. that exact same thing. So I just gave up after a while. So. <laughs> uh, no, good stuff. Good, but, I, but I agree that the natural partner is the way. The other way, and I know the person, I saw it coming through the chat room there, uh, someone is saying, you know, how do you turn event donors? The real secret is what I was alluding to in one of my final slides there. If you can find the person who brought them to the event and use that human connector, that natural partner or human connector, and let that person be involved with the next communication, I have find that works magically. Give them the tool if there's a large number of them that they can communicate with them, but yeah. let them share, say in their own words, why are they involved in this organization? Mm -hmm. Hey, Jay and Steve, though, the last person that you're looking at is talking about how we can take somebody from an event, turn them into a larger uh, mm -hmm. donor slash investor or whatever. But uh, Jay's one of the best storytellers I've ever heard in my life, but it's a really short story about a an amazing hospital in the Denver area had their signature event, been doing it for 10 years, raising $750,000 net, 1,300 people. A uh, fascinating uh, signature event where the stories are told and people just leave that just totally motivated and moved. But what they had never done is they, at the next time they contacted those people was basically a year later for the next. Ooh signature event, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we did was we did a really simple thing. We got to all the table people and, uh, you know, kind of the event co-chairs and the committee, whatever was there. Look, we just want to get 50 out of that 1,300 people. And let's just, let's just figure out who the best 50 or who 50 really good people we'd like to get with. We did, Jay, what you suggested. We sent them a note from the chair saying, great, we'd love to sit down with you. They ended up getting visits with about 30 of the 50, and they raised a couple million dollars more. Now, they were really happy with the 750, but they actually raised twice, three times, actually, the amount of money from the dinner, which is being able to meet with 30 people as a result of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I think I think again, it's like just ask, right? I mean, let's just go do it. Uh, there's not a lot of strategy involved in finding your best people at the event and go sit down with them. That's great, Tom. The favorite, my favorite part of your presentation that really stood out to me was when you you said, you know, don't make a specific ask for a dollar amount. Instead, say, hey, do you want to help five kids who are in need? And that really right. stuck out to me, and I think that prompted a question from John in the chat room. And he was wondering if you should never decide on a dollar amount for someone, if you should maybe just kind of relate it to something else that's going on yeah. uh, with them. How do you think, what do you, you know, what's your philosophy on that? Do you well, think two, anyone... two quick things. Yeah, uh, Steve, uh, is it John that asked that? Yeah, I believe so, John. Yeah, mm-hmm. so John, so it's like, well, number one, do the math. You have to do the math. You have to know the numbers. You have to know the projects. You have to know that we have 3,500 patients who come through our free health center at Good Sam Hospital, for example, and we know that it's $225 per visit. You have to know the math, okay? But but my point about not making decisions for people is, well, we, we just did a strategy yesterday for a $3.5 million project, and the team was making a decision for the lead investor that, he, that we were only going to ask him for a million dollars when we were done with the strategy, we're going to ask him to see, what, hey, help us. Can, can you do this mm-hmm. instead of making that decision for them? But tied back to your point about money, everything we do, our goal is to, is to not have that be a dollar request, but rather an impact request that has a green cost to it. And mm-hmm. I hope that makes sense to people listening to this right now when you look at the blue impact and the green income. Talk about your impact, turn that into a project, uh, you know, a child, a scholarship, uh, whatever, and then just put a number on that. So does that help at all? That's great. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, we've had a couple of requests for some stories from your Notre Dame days uh, there, Tom. Uh, so I'm wondering if maybe there's I wonder a, why. <laughs> Jay, yeah. if something Jay. sticks out in your mind. <laughs> Hey, Jay, I'll take a prompt from you any time, but, uh, oh, there's, I mean, there's so many times I messed up. Um, Tell us about a success, though, Tom. Let's hear, let's hear about a, one of your big successes. Oh, no, well, well, the success is uh, things like being in your, your wonderful home there in Indianapolis and having Father Hesburgh, who was probably one of the premier presidents of all time, which is an amazing guy, a great priest, and was president for 30 years, and but he never once in all the time at Notre Dame, we raised a lot of money, never once asked anybody for money. But one of my favorite stories, is we went down to meet a foundation down there. We're having lunch, just Father Hesburgh and myself. I'm like 24 years old. I'm petrified. And we have three, you know, big wigs sitting across from us. Father Hesburgh lays out this grand vision for the engineering school, Jay. Then he stands up, puts his hand on my shoulder, looks at them and says, I have no idea what Tom's going to ask you for, but I'm sure you're going to help. And then he left. And not only were they, those three looking at him leaving, I'm turning around going, where are you going? Oh, my God. <laughs> so I turn around in my uh, puppy dog, 24-year-old voice. They look at me and go, well, Tom, what do you want us to do? And I'm like, a mill, a mill, a a, a, a a million dollars to help with what father wanted. And they looked at each other and went, yeah, we can do that. And I'm like, holy criminy, this whole just ass thing really does work. So as badly as I uh, delivered it, uh, it was more about the impact in the case. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I'm going to tell one more good Hesburg thing because it, it, it goes back a long way, Jay and Steve, but it might be a great way to end the, the conversation. Um, you know, in our world, executive directors, presidents, even board members, I'm a big believer in sprinkling magic dust on people. Their job is to sprinkle magic dust. And our job in the development world is to help turn that into something to help the impact. Well, he would take people, we'd bring people in, he'd take them up to the top of the library, all glass, and walk around, and he would lay out the most incredible vision. I, I heard it a number of times, and every time he did it, I'd be like, wow. And, of course, all these people were, wow. Here's the interesting dynamic for the people on the phone, though. He would lay that out at dinner. It was always a Friday night. It was called a fly-in, and then we'd do something with them on Saturday. And then we would say to them, Sunday morning, 
somebody from our team is going to come and visit with you one-on-one in the next week to 10 days. And we're going to sit down and talk about all this and your role. Well, uh, the the numbers and the response, Jay and Steve, were just staggering. Uh, And it just, it, it was my earliest lesson. I didn't have the word impact income then, but it was my earliest lesson that if people really, really understand what you're trying to do, and somebody's able to articulate that message, people want to help. You know, Drucker's great line about trying to find people who want to move from success to significance, I mean, that's the best people that, you know, we can be looking for. Um, And I think if we just, our job is to present them opportunities to do that. And I think, you know, you guys can help us with, you know, maybe the definition and the strength of relationship and, Really what I took away from your guys' stuff is that it's about a prioritization of your prospects and, you know, who really are our very best people and who has the strongest relationship, which I think is great. So, so, so so true, Tom. Well, thank you for those stories, Tom. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> well, we are approaching the 2 o'clock hour, so I want to want to wrap things up just to be sensitive for uh, people's afternoons right. and their work schedule. Um, I think that was a great presentation. Uh, you know, I took away a lot, certainly. I hope all the listeners did as well. Um, just in the few minutes we have remaining, Tom, do you want to give some few of the folks a little bit more information about your organization for those who aren't familiar with you? Uh, yeah, actually, everything we do, Steve, is at 4impact.org ton of resources that Jay knows. He, I love when Jay Love sends me a little note and say, yeah, that was some good stuff on there. So uh, for impact.org, you can just about anything that you want. We, uh, we, we're working all around the world right now. Ireland, uh, just uh, doing some really good high-level stuff. We coach, we train, we help. Not going to give a big sales feel necessarily, but um, we just enjoy working with people who get the whole idea of being for impact. So um, you can get a lot more information at forimpact.org, but more than just information, uh, you can go use that. There's video up there and, and a lot of, I think, a lot of good content uh, that goes much deeper than I did today, Steve. So thanks for the opportunity for me uh, to do this. Yeah, it was a joy to have you, honestly. Um, and if there were any questions that we didn't get to, you know, feel free to visit Tom's website, shoot him an email, you know, send Jay a tweet. He's pretty active on Twitter. If we didn't get to all your questions, um, and Jay, while we're while we're we've got a few minutes left, maybe 30 seconds. Do you want to uh, talk to people a little bit about Bloomering if they're interested in learning more about us? Very much so. If if those of you are out there, if you're currently using a database and not happy with it, you don't feel like everybody in your organization because one of the things Tom and I have talked about for the last 10 or 15 years is, you know, having a database tool that the actual fundraisers and the executives can use. If you feel like you don't have that, or if you're still using uh, spreadsheets or anything else of that nature and you'd like to find out about it, uh, just go to our website. There's a place there to find out additional information. We're at bloomerang.com. CO and you can there and you know you can let us know also we'll be following up with you if you've attended the webinar here and if you want to in that follow up email if you would like to have someone to get you further information just let us know there we'd be glad to help great thanks jay and you can see on that last slide that uh, we, we do do weekly webinars. We're going to take a week off uh, next week just to give Jay a little bit of a break. Uh, but we'll be back in two weeks. We're going to have a really awesome discussion on capital campaigns uh, with Linda Lysakowski. That's going to be a great presentation. I was looking at the slides a little bit earlier today. So you can visit our, our webinar page. It's in our resources section on bloomerang.co. You can register for that today. Totally free webinar. Uh, 100% educational, so we all hope you'll join us for that. So with that, I'll say a final goodbye and thanks to Tom. Tom, thanks again. That was really great to have You're you welcome, join us. Steve. Thanks, Jay. Great being with all you. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. all right. Thanks to everyone who joined us on the call, and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye now. Bye-bye.